Cheers, guys, and welcome to Uncle Scott's Pancast. If you're interested in what I'm pouring, we'll get to that a little bit later in the Pancast. Today, we are talking Lodge. We're going to talk saffron, uh, some stuff I saw at Costco. We're going to talk California Olive Ranch olive oil, uh, Smithy, Falk, and more. Let's jump in and get started. So I want to start out with the big box battle, Costco and Sam's today. Went to Costco over the weekend and on the way to Costco, I mentioned to my wife that I had received an email that morning from Costco talking about this week's treasure hunt. And uh, she asked, well, what is the treasure hunt? If you've ever paid attention to Costco executives when they speak, or there's been some specials on the way Costco does business, they always play up that going to Costco is a treasure hunt. Uh, there may be some new item you were not expecting, and uh, you hunt around and you find things that, that maybe you didn't expect to be there, and it's a treasure hunt, and it changes from time to time. And my wife was a little skeptical of this, and then I noticed within about 20 feet of walking through the door, she was immediately drawn to some of those uh, specials they have right as you walk in, looking at some new soap dispensers. And I said, aha, you have found yourself a treasure. Now, I found myself a treasure and if you remember last week, I talked about not liking grill pans. I don't like them at all. But I was at Costco and ran across this guy. This is a Lodge double-sided grill griddle pan with the lines that I despise. So I immediately threw away all principles and jumped on this guy. How could you refuse 25 bucks for a brand new piece of Lodge cast iron? I did find my treasure there. Now, the treasure hunt is obviously fun when you find something you want. The downside to it, and kind of the downside to Costco in general, is that things are not always there once you get used to expecting them there. For example, um, I've got a bird feeder, and I've been buying the Costco Audubon um, bird seed for six, seven years now. I buy a box every month or two, and all of a sudden I go in the other day, and it's gone. Um, likewise, some nitrile gloves. They got some that were... Uh, powder free and black and they felt good and they were great for uh, food prep. I use them uh, fixing all this food around here and um, got used to buying them and I go in one time and they're gone. So the upside of the treasure hunt is you might find a treasure you weren't expecting. The downside is sometimes you can't depend on things being at Costco every time you go. I also noticed that they are now carrying Saffron. And if you've ever made paella or any dish that uses saffron, you are well aware that pound for pound, saffron is the most expensive uh, spice in the world. So this one, this jar is one gram and is about $16.50. But what I liked about it is they say it's organic. And it's from uh, La Mancha, Spanish saffron. So it's from Spain. And it has a protected designation of origin. So I do like that. Um, saffron, uh, it can be kind of faked. You can get fake saffron out there. It's very expensive. There's a lot of incentive for people to kind of um, come up with substitute fake products. I haven't tried the Kirkland uh, saffron yet, but what I do like about it, it does have a USDA organic symbol on there. And just knowing that it has the Kirkland brand on there and there's a multi-billion dollar corporation behind there, I've got a little bit of trust there because if anything were ever um, not up to snuff there, they would have been sued into oblivion by now. So had pretty good luck with Kirkland products and I'm gonna try the saffron. So that's about $16.50. Um, over at Sam's Club, I mentioned the deal on uh, California Olive Ranch olive oil um, between 12 and 13 bucks for a liter. And I mentioned that I had bought 12 liters last week. And I thought that was a screaming price on there. And I checked the dates and got at least about a year or so left on the, those. Let's see, John Smith wrote in and asked about 12 liters of olive oil, expires in a year and a half. He's asking, what am I doing changing the oil in my car with that? Actually, I go through about a liter, a bottle like this, 
um, just about every month, sometimes even a little bit more. And we use olive oil on everything around here. Um, cooking, baking, um, I fry in it sometimes if it's something like, something like a fried okra where the temperature is not very hot. I wouldn't deep fry in it. I wouldn't use it for a steak where the temperature is going to be a lot higher and it might smoke, but uh, kind of light frying, I use it. I use it to finish dishes. I even eat it on toast sometimes. I'm not quite putting it on cereal yet. But for me, I thought 12 bottles uh, get my year's supply of olive oil, and that saves. Of course, you're spending money. You're actually not saving anything, but over regular retail, seven, eight bucks a bottle times 12 easily justifies the year's uh, Sam's Club membership just on that one purchase. So look for olive oil at Sam's if you want a deal on California Olive Ranch. The people have spoken. Um, I put up a poll question the other day um, trying to decide which product to review next, and I gave three choices, an all-clad D5, 12-inch uh, frying pan, stainless steel, an all-clad stainless steel 3.5 liter deep fryer with basket, and a Smithy 12-inch cast iron uh, skillet. And the Smithy won. So this will be the next big in-depth review and cooking feature on this guy. 12 inch cast iron skillet, very high end, very heavy, feels very solid. And the question with this Smithy is going to be at $200 plus, I think these are going for about $210 right now. Is that worth it when you can get a Lodge cast iron skillet for less than $30? So of course we'll do a ton of cooking and testing in the pan and really focus down on whether a high-end cast iron pan can still be a value. Who knows? I have not cooked anything in it yet. The Debouye online newsletter. Did you guys get an email about that? If so, did you notice this guy? Hey, who is that? in the official Debouye newsletter and also on the Debouye website. Uh, Debouye got in touch a month or so ago and asked me uh, if I'd like to do a collaborative seasoning video with them that would appear on their site. And you know what I said? Heck yeah, I would. That is quite an honor for um, kind of a, I'm kind of a big guy in real life, but in the cooking and chef world, I am still a very little guy. So it's kind of a little uh, pat on the back for myself there. Now, I didn't realize the newsletter was going out. I worked on this video uh, several weeks ago and they've had it and I didn't know when it was going to go live. And all of a sudden I got some feedback from some, some of you guys saying, hey, did you know you're in the Debouye newsletter? So it went live and I found out from you guys. So that's nice. Uh, Debouye, they promote their products as for amateurs and professionals alike and they have access to real deal French uh, chefs for that professional part of it. For the amateur part, I'm kind of honored to be part of that amateur part of the equation there for Debouye's cookware. And even though I'm working on a couple of videos with Debouye, um, my review policy still stands. Anything I review, I buy with my own money and I don't accept any free products to appear in reviews. So that still stands. Let's see, shorts, YouTube shorts, short videos. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with the YouTube shorts. Uh, in general, I much prefer doing long form cooking and review and kind of feature type videos, 20, 30 minutes talking about frying pans. Um, that's what kind of Uncle Scott's kitchen has been from the start. However, YouTube is competing with whoever, Instagram and TikTok and whoever else, and they are trying to really promote these short videos. And sometimes they are eight or nine seconds. Um, it takes me half hour to review a frying pan and I don't really know what to do oftentimes in eight or nine seconds. So I've put a few up and they usually get four or 5,000 views, which is okay. Um, usually that would earn me less than a dollar so literally almost worthless. But I had one kind of take off and it's getting close to 300,000 views. Um, I don't like working on them. I'd rather do the long form, but YouTube is promoting them and it's almost like uh, advertising for the channel. So I hope they are not too annoying to uh, everybody that's been around a long time, but they're kind of a necessary evil, if you will, at the moment. Speaking of in-depth feature reviews, let's talk Falk. I put up a, a big 
in-depth Falk copper cookware review the other day. Um, well over 30 minutes, almost 40 minutes of coverage of these uh, Falk pans and got a bunch of feedback on that review. Let's see, Rue Spike wrote in and said, excellent show featuring many details and most definitely by a long shot the best Falk video on the internet. Thank you very much. I put a lot of time into that video. For some reason, and one reason I did four months of cooking in the Falks is I was supposed to get on that video and if you can have writer's block, kind of videographers, YouTubers block, I just could not get that video out and I don't know why. And finally I just forced myself to start and that's what came out. So that's the way it happens sometimes. It seems like most everybody agreed with the review. Um, I gave the Falks thumbs up, although they are not perfect. And it seems like some of the criticism of Falk um, a lot of it is about the handle. The Kevin XB8EX says those stainless steel handles make it look really cheap. People don't like the looks of that handle. And it's kind of sleek and modern. It's actually fairly beefy, a little more square than some other handles, and it's stainless steel. And admittedly here, I like, and I called it out in the review, I like the look of the uh, cast iron, more classic looking handle a lot better than this uh, signature series handle. And lots of people agree with that. And I don't think it's the metal because I've got a Debouille handle here. This is a Debouille Affinity frying pan. That's a stainless steel handle, but I think a good looking stainless steel handle. The Falk, it's very sturdy, beefy, but it's kind of rectangular and lots of people just don't like the look of that. And it doesn't have anything to do with the performance of the pan. It is purely cosmetic, so I don't want to count off for anything cosmetic that is a subjective uh, opinion. But it works fine, just some people don't like the look on that fault. 517 Piper uh, wrote in and said, I love my fault purchases. Purchased my first pan after watching your video review of the Saucier. So that little Saucier, he had bought a pan after watching that review. It says now he or she, I'm not sure, buys a new pan, a uh, new piece, every time they have a sale. And I think especially on these coppers and when you get into the kind of the stratosphere of prices on cookware, it pays to wait for sales. Um, mentioned in the video, I got, I think over $100 off on this pan. And if you take a pan that's 450 and knock it down to 325 or so, that's fairly significant. Let's see, Carl French 8538 says, you really can't beat new Falk copper in terms of bang for the buck. I agree with that. Very good value with the Falks. Let's see, Triax MMB uh, posted a comment. The first uh, part of the comment said, he or she again had posted three times and the comments have been disappearing. And finally um, posted and it stuck. Um, I get, uh, people angry at me sometimes saying, I posted something, why did you delete my post? I do not delete posts. Um, in five years of running Uncle Scott's Kitchen, I've maybe have deleted two or three posts just because someone was posting a link to some sort of adult content or something, but I do not delete posts around here and I have no idea why sometimes when you post something, it it disappears and then it appears later. Who knows? Um, he's talking about redoing his kitchen and asked about the uh, the large stove upstairs, that big uh, Ilve uh, gas stove and what I think about that. I think if you have a kitchen that's big enough and you can afford it, I am all for getting kind of one of those bucket list stoves. Uh, life is too short. Um, when I bought that stove upstairs, um, it was way, way, way expensive, but you know what? I've used it an average of twice a day for um, almost eight years now, and I enjoy it. I've gotten every penny of my money's worth out of that stove. If you can do it, I, I highly encourage you to do it, especially if you love to cook. Now, if you're putting it on a credit card at 30% interest, I would not do that. I would only do it if you can pay it off. Let's see, he says he's currently got a 30 inch cooktop and is thinking about moving to a 48. So the one up there you see in the videos, that is a 48 and it's got um, six burners plus um, an oval um, uh, burner underneath that grill that you see. So really seven burners. Um, oftentimes we don't have more than two or three going at once, but around the holidays, 
I have gotten six burners going at one time. So it is nice to have a bigger range during the holidays, but for day-to-day -day use, um, I think it might be a little bit overkill unless you got the room for it. And I'll just say on that grill, um, the grill surface there, very rarely do we use that grill. I end up using that mostly to store. I usually put a cutting board there and my salt and pepper and use it for my uh, mise en place and ingredients when I'm cooking. Only rarely do we ever use that grill. I don't know what you guys would think about it, but maybe we should do a little bit more content on uh, kitchens and appliances around here at some point. Also kind of talking about money and cookware and waiting on fancy stuff. Um, let's see, Graham5961 wrote in and was talking about living with his parents and kind of living vicariously through some of his uh, cooking dreams from uh, watching the channel. He hopes to one day have a beautiful space and a bunch of cookware and a big gas stove. I say don't wait. Uh, take 20, 30 bucks, get you a lodge cast iron and just jump in and get started. Do some cooking now and if you learn how to cook something nice, I bet your parents would love a delicious meal. Life is too short. Get on it. Let's see, George Pagakis9854 wrote in and said, Hey Scott, I've seen other channels with fewer subscribers that have a lot more sponsors than I do. I need to get on uh, getting some sponsors around here if anybody knows of anyone or anyone is interested in reaching a uh, hardcore um, cookware, loving audience, loves good food and drink, get in touch and we'll work something out. Okay, a couple of pancasts ago, we talked about grappa, an Italian liquor. And um, I was talking with a fellow named Ennio. He started sending me some pictures. Uh, he's from Italy originally and cooking all kinds of fantastic uh, food. He's been sending me a bunch of stuff. But anyway, he said I should open the pancast with a toast with some grappa. I live in Utah and it's tough to find Italian grappa. As a matter of fact, it's actually impossible. I uh, went to my local liquor store and they don't carry any grappa except for one from Oregon and it's kind of a, an American Oregon grappa and I'm not sure it's the exact same thing as uh, the traditional stuff from Italy, which is what I'm looking for. Um, went to Sandy, Utah the other day. There is a new flagship Utah liquor store over there with a big selection, actually a nice modern store and um, they don't carry it either. And I talked to the guy there and he looked it up. Uh, Utah, which the state of Utah sells all the liquor in Utah. So you gotta get it at a state store and they don't carry any Italian grappa at all in the entire state. And I asked him, well, can we special order some? He's like, yeah, we can special order you some grappa. But it turns out if you get a special order, you have to buy an entire case. So I might want one bottle, maybe two bottles of grappa, just to have some around. I don't need 12 bottles of grappa and four or $500 of expense. However, they did have some Averna. And this is completely different than grappa. This has kind of bitter orange peel, lemon rind. Um, it's an Amaro Siciliano from Sicily. Uh, Amaro means bitter in Italian. And this is kind of an after dinner digestive drink. And that is what I am toasting with today. Uh, as far as Italian liquor goes, this is some good stuff and about as close as I can get here in Utah. So cheers on that. And I do know my real deal Italian friends go to dinner with them over in Italy at their houses or apartments or flats, whatever they want to call them. They keep that Averna in the fridge. After a big meal, they pull it out and give everybody a little shot of that after dinner. I think it does help your dinner digest. <clears throat> and or scorches your entire digestive tract. Let's see, 47 Pricey wrote in and said he hadn't watched all the recent videos, but he noticed that the visuals looked fantastic in more recent videos and wonders if I upgraded my camera. Let's talk a little bit about camera equipment here for anybody that's interested. Um, it is always the bane of my existence, uh, cameras, and not only cameras, microphones. Good Lord, getting uh, audio to sound right in a YouTube video is surprisingly difficult, at least for me. Um, I used to use um, a DSLR that had a video function. I think it was a Canon EOS 5D Mark IV, and it was okay. I've used various iPhones, other cameras. 
I've got an iPhone 15, which I used in one of the uh, recent pancasts. What I found out here, the hard way, and again, the audio drives me crazy, I used the nice cameras to uh, take the video for the uh, pancast. The microphone is on this side, so it kind of screwed up the audio, and you can buy kind of a rig thing and attach an external mic to the iPhone, so I may try that again. Uh, this video is being shot with a Sony ZV-1, and I've used this for a while now, but I always shoot in HD, which would be uh, 1080p. Uh, for the last couple of videos, and I guess it was noticeable because people were writing in about it, I went up to the 4K setting. Now there are benefits and drawbacks to shooting in 4K. Um, on the upside, it's a lot more detail in the picture and apparently people can tell the difference. On the downside, that detail, I may have more of a face for radio than uh, HD or 4K. Who knows about that? And also, just from an equipment perspective, it just gobbles up uh, bandwidth when you try to upload something, when you're recording on the memory cards, hard drives, that 4K, it just eats through them. And I've also noticed with that Sony ZV-1, the doggone thing will overheat sometimes. If you guys remember, um, a month or so ago, I did that interview with Jed from uh, Cook Culture. And thank goodness I had set up a backup camera because when you're trying to do HD, the thing conked out and overheated after about seven minutes, which is not something you want to happen during a live interview. Uh, the computer I use to primarily, this is a, an Apple M1 laptop and it's pretty fast, but I do most of the editing on a 2018 uh, iMac, which has 40 gigs of memory and it was fairly um, it was fairly nice for when I bought it, but doing 4K editing on that iMac, it just chugs along. So um, I may need to do another round of hardware upgrades around here. There's always something new to buy, but I do appreciate people noticing uh, the, the 4K. Not to get too far into the weeds of YouTube, but these videos are seen on cell phones, they're seen on laptops, they're seen on desktops, and they're seen on big screen TV. So I can sit on my couch and watch an Uncle Scott's Kitchen video, uh, you know, big 50, 60 inch wide screen, and it's got to look good there. It's also got to be visible on a one or two inch cell phone screen. So it's very odd for someone who doesn't have any kind of professional video background to try and get everything to look and sound right. And as always, sometimes it will work very well, and sometimes I will screw it up. I may have inadvertently caused a snowstorm. I know it's a little bit early in the season, and I may have jumped a gun, but got out on the deck the other day and cleaned the uh, Kamado Joe off and busted out the first pork butt of the season. We got the awnings out, and of course it snowed the next day. Had to put the awnings right back in. But I used this guy. This is a Weber iGrill Mini um, thermometer, and um, seems to work uh, fairly well. I bought a Weber charcoal kettle grill a couple of years ago, and this was included with it. Um, it's got a little transmitter, and then of course the uh, temperature probe plugs into that, and you stick this in the um, meat. What I found interesting these days is that Used to, you would just stick a thermometer in the meat and you would get a reading. This doesn't give you any display here. You have to download an app. So my thermometer has an app and a privacy policy. And it also asked me to sign up for a newsletter. That is the world we live in these days. All right, look somewhere on the screen for links to other pancasts you will surely enjoy. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Pancast. <laughs>